In the last two lectures, we looked at what machine learning is, and we saw some examples of how to accomplish it. In this lecture, and the next lecture, we won't look at more models and more ways to search for good models. We'll instead look at what happens before and after you do machine learning. Here's the basic recipe that we showed in the first lecture, consisting of abstracting your problem to a standard task by choosing instances and features, choosing your model class and searching for a good model. What we're going to do today is look at what happens afterwards. Specifically, how do we evaluate our model? How do we figure out whether the model that our search has produced is actually any good? And in the next lecture, we will look at what happens before the recipe. How do you get your data and how do you prepare it so that it's suitable for use in machine learning? In this video, we'll stick mainly to binary classification. So that's classification with a positive class and a negative class. And in that case, we can often think of the, the classifier as a detector for the positive class. And for now, we can look at two simple metrics for the performance of a classifier. The error, how many misclassifications it makes, how many examples it gets wrong, and the accuracy, how many examples it gets right. Most of the things we talk about in this video, however, are not specific to classification and also hold for regression experiments. With a performance metric in hand, we can start comparing different models. For instance, in the first lecture, we saw three types of models, a linear model, a decision tree, and a k-nearest neighbor classifier. Given a data set, we can train all three and look at how they do, what their accuracies and errors are. And here are three examples of what that looks like on the example data in the first lecture. But within one model class, we also have the hyperparameters to worry about. For instance, if we train a k-nearest neighbor classifier, the value k tells us how many of our neighbors, instances nearby our new point in our feature space, how many of those should we look at to make a classification. And this is a hyperparameter, a value that we have to set ourselves, mostly based on our intuition. So we can look at what kind of performance we get for different values of this hyperparameter. In this case, k equals 3, 9, or 27. And all of these choices, which model class we use, and how we set each of its hyperparameters, we would like to establish not just by a random guess, but by experiment. And this is the basic business of machine learning. Once you have your data, you establish which model is suitable for that data by experiments. The basic structure of that kind of experiment is very simple. It looks like this. You train a classifier A, and you train a classifier B. These could be different model classes or classifiers from the same model class with different hyperparameters. You compute the error of each, and we'll look at different performance metrics later, but for now we can stick with the error. And the lower the error, the better the model. Like I said, this is a very simple way of doing experiments, but there are a couple of important questions to ask ourselves. On which data do we compute the error? How do we eliminate random effects? And is error really the best metric to use? And we'll start with which data we compute the error on. We set this issue up already in the first lecture, where we showed an example of overfitting, a model that fits the training data really well and really precisely, but actually so precisely that its predictions are specific to the training data and unlikely to generalize to new data we might see. In other words, it's memorizing the data. For that reason, we never judge our performance on the training data. An error of zero on the training data could simply mean that the model has perfectly memorized the data set. Instead, we withhold some data, and that data is called the test set. We train our model on the training data, and then we compute its performance on the test data. In some cases, data set comes pre-split in a canonical training and a canonical test set. If not, you have to split it yourself. And in deciding how to split the data, it's important to note that you shouldn't look at the proportion it's not a 80%, 20% split. The absolute size of the test data is what's important. The test data should contain at least 500 examples, but 10,000 or more is ideal. And once you've split off a test data with enough examples, the rest is the training data. And we'll look at this a little bit more later in the lecture. But that's not the whole story, because sometimes you need to test many different models. For instance, this value of k, you may want to test every single value of k between 1 and 29. To show you what happens, 
if you do that. Let's go back to our data, but subsample it a little bit so that the effects become exaggerated. We start with k equals 1, and we see that we achieve an error on our test set of 0 0.12. For k equals 2, the error goes up a little, and we continue like that, and we see the error is sometimes a little higher and sometimes a little lower. Out of these 25 trials, the lowest error is achieved here at k equals 23, where we achieve an error of 0 0.08. Now we've been careful to split our test and training data, so presumably there shouldn't be any overfitting. However, let's look at what happens if we take another subsample from the same data and rerun the experiment. We do another 25 runs for 25 different values of k, and this time we see that k equals 5 gives us the best performance, a performance of 0 0.08. This is surprising because the data comes from the same source. So for one sample from this source of data, we end up with k equals 23 as the best choice of hyperparameter, and for another sample we end up with k equals 5 as the best choice of hyperparameter. And the conclusion here is that we're overfitting again. Just like choosing the parameters of your model, choosing the hyperparameters of your model is also a learning process. And like any learning process, it's susceptible to overfitting. If we reuse the same data over and over again, we will overfit to this data. And when we're choosing hyperparameters, as we've done now, that means reusing both the training and the test data. This is an instance of the multiple testing problem in statistics. We're testing so many things that the likelihood of a noticeable effect popping up by chance increases. We are in danger of ascribing meaning to random fluctuations. The simple answer to the problem of multiple testing is not to test multiple times, which gives us this protocol for evaluating machine learning models. And this is what's used most of the time in modern machine learning practice. We split our data into a train and test data set, we sample randomly and we ensure that at least 500 examples are in the test set, ideally many more. We choose our model and our hyperparameters only using the training set without looking at the test set. We state our hypothesis, for instance k nearest neighbors with k equals 7 beats some existing model, or k nearest neighbors with k equal to 7 is better than k nearest neighbors with k equal to 12. And once we have our hypothesis, we test our hypothesis once on the test data. And this is usually at the very end of your project, when you're writing down your results, writing down your conclusions, this is when you look at the test data. So the main rule, just to emphasize this, don't reuse your test data. The more you use your test data, the less valuable it becomes due to multiple testing. If you do reuse your test data, what happens is that you pick the wrong model, as we saw before, where we thought we were very confident that k equals 23 was the correct hyperparameter, but actually when we sampled some more data it turned out that that was completely spurious, and it also inflates your performance estimate. So we saw in this experiment that if we picked k equals 23 that the error dropped to 0 0.08, but again when we resample data, when we look at new people, we saw that the error for the model with k equals 23 went up massively. So like I say, you avoid reusing your test data by choosing your hyperparameters and your model only based on the training data. But remember, it's not a good idea to judge the performance of your model on the data that it's trained on. The solution is to make another split. We take our training data and we split that again into a training and a validation set. And using this training and validation set, we can simulate the kind of experiments that we're going to do later on the test set when it's time to look at the test set. So during model and hyperparameter selection, we train on the training data, and we evaluate our models on the validation data. And then when we have a good idea of what we want to claim, we do a final experiment where we test on the test data, and we train on the original training data, that is the combination of the training and the validation data. Including your validation data in the final run is usually allowed, but there are some cases where it's not allowed. So if you're using a standard benchmark, you should check if that is the case. And if you use new data, you should describe carefully whether or not you do this. Now this might seem like a simple principle, but it does go wrong a lot. Not just in student papers, but also in published research. If it does go wrong, here's the sort of thing you might come across. In this fictional example, the authors are introducing a new method, labeled ours, which has a hyperparameter k. They are claiming that their model beats every baseline because their numbers are higher for specific hyperparameters. And the authors here are doing exactly what we showed in the earlier slides. They are evaluating performance for every value of the hyperparameter, and then picking those values that perform well on these datasets. These numbers create three impressions, 
that are not actually validated by this experiment. First, that the authors have a better model than the two other methods shown. Second, that if you want to run the model on dataset 1, you should use k equals 3 as the hyperparameter. And third, that if you have data like dataset 1, then you can expect an error of around 0.08 using this model. None of these conclusions can be drawn from this experiment because we have not ruled out multiple testing. If we do this correctly, we split the datasets, we choose hyperparameters for each dataset separately based on the validation performance, and then for the final paper, the final experiments, we run one single experiment with this hyperparameter value. If we do that, the results look something like this. Note that the numbers have changed, because in the previous example we gave ourselves an advantage by multiple testing. These numbers are lower, but more accurate. I made these numbers up, but this is the sort of thing you might see. Now we can actually draw the three conclusions that the table implies. On dataset 3, the new method is generally the best. If we want to use the method on dataset 3, or similar data, then k equals 2 is a good bet for the value of the hyperparameter k. If our data is similar to that of dataset 3, we could reasonably expect a performance of around 0.24 on this data. And this is the approach that people most commonly use, but even though most people now use this approach, you should still mention exactly what you did in your report so that people don't assume that you did it incorrectly. Now, after splitting off your test data and your validation data, it may be the case that you are left with relatively little training data to work with. In that case, you can make better use of your training data by performing cross-validation. You split your data into five chunks, called folds, and for each specific choice of hyperparameter that you want to test, you do five runs, each one with one of the folds as validation data. And then you average the scores of all these runs. This can be costly because you need to train five times as many classifiers, but you do ensure that every instance in your data has been used as a training example at least once. After selecting your hyperparameters using these cross-validation scores, you can still test once on the test data. You may occasionally see papers that estimate the error of their finally chosen model also by cross-validation, but this is a complicated business and it's mostly fallen out of fashion. There are some types of data where splitting randomly is not a valid choice, most commonly temporal data. If our instances are not independently sampled, for instance because they are ordered in time, then it's important to maintain that time ordering in the data set. The reason for this is that this test train split is a simulation of what you will see in the real world. So if you're building a system that trains on data from the past and is then used to make predictions on new data as it comes in, then that's the situation that you want to simulate in using your training and your test data. In other words, you want to simulate using your model at a particular point in time, training on all the data before that point in time and evaluating on all the data after that point in time. In order to simulate this correctly, you need to keep your dataset ordered by time and split at a particular point in time. If you want to apply cross-validation on this kind of data, again, you need to keep your data ordered according to time. So in this case, when you split off multiple validation sets, you should train only on the data before each validation block, like this. If you don't, then you are training on data from the future which, depending on the use case, may give you a lot higher performance than is realistic to expect in a production setting, where you don't have access to data from the future. Finally, you may ask, which hyperparameters should I try? For instance, if I'm training a k-nearest neighbor classifier, should I try every value of k from 1 to 25, or every value of k from 1 to 100? Or perhaps I'm fine just trying values like 10, 25, and 100. This is mostly up to you. A large majority of hyperparameter optimization happens by trial and error. You use your intuition about what the hyperparameters mean and how they influence the model to help you choose reasonable values, and then you perform a series of experiments by trial and error to tease out good values for each of these hyperparameters. In some cases, something a little more formal is required. One thing you can do in that case is a grid search. You define a finite set of values per hyperparameter, and you try all possible combinations. And this is called a grid search, because if you visualize the grid of all combinations that you will try, they form a grid in the space of hyperparameters. And if you're looking for something even more powerful, you can think back to the last lecture, where we talked about black box optimization. Finding good hyperparameter values for a learning problem is an instance of black box optimization, so methods like random search, simulated annealing, and even evolutionary methods 
can be applied to hyperparameter search. Although this can be very expensive in terms of the computational resources required. There is one pitfall in using grid search, which is illustrated very neatly by this diagram here. Imagine that you have two hyperparameters, one important and one unimportant. Then by using grid search, then by using grid search over nine values, you are limiting yourself to trying only three values of each hyperparameter. If instead you check random points in the hyperparameter space, what you see is that because you've eliminated overlaps, you're trying more values for both parameters, and you're exploring more of the parameter space of the important hyperparameter. That's all we'll say for now about hyperparameter search. It's very likely that this is the sort of thing you'll be doing in the project, so you'll hopefully get some hands-on experience with this sort of thing pretty soon. In the next video, we'll look a little closer at the different evaluation metrics that are available both for regression models and classification models.